and to give it a name, I'll call it, I'll call this model, I'll call it the uh, electrostatic model or electrostatic spinless model because the interaction between the electron and the nucleus is described by the electrostatic interaction between the two electrostatic field produced by the nucleus. And also we're obviously ignoring spin in this. We know electrons do have spin. <coughs> All right. Uh, so um, so uh, some physics is missing, and in particular it's obvious that the spin is missing because we know about spin. And uh, it turns out that spin and other similar effects explain the fine structure. We'll go into this in more detail later on, but the main, uh, the main thrust of my lecture today is going to revolve around how do we incorporate spin as a new degree of freedom into the description of the system, how does it come into wave functions, and in particular, how does angular momentum interact with, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with spin and the, uh, the extra degrees of freedom that are being introduced. All right. <clears throat> um, one basic question here is, is uh, what justifies an neglected spin? Uh, part of the answer is, is that uh, we're, neglecting, we're neglecting the degrees of freedom that we know about. Uh, you may recall earlier in the semester that I explained that when you're looking for complete sets of commuting observables, you may stop before you get to the end of the list. As I said, you may know that there are other things around that you could measure, but you just choose not to measure them. Uh, and in that case, this is equivalent physically to the neglect of certain degrees of freedom. And uh, it may be justified if uh, those degrees of freedom do not interact strongly with the ones that you're interested in. So in particular, in the case of a, a so-called spinless electron, which is what we seem to have here, uh, the basic uh, physical fact is that spins interact with magnetic fields. And if you have a problem that doesn't have magnetic fields, or only weak ones, then it may be appropriate just to ignore the spin and treat the electron as if it were a spinless particle. This is very common in practice because Electrostatic fields with no magnetic fields are, are very common situations for electrons moving in condensed matter physics and atomic physics all over the place. And that's just what we did here. We looked at the electrostatic interactions and ignored any magnetic fields. <coughs> all right. Now, uh, at this point, I'd like to shift attention, your attention to this table, which I've prepared here. This table uh, includes a bunch of stuff we've done already in the course that summarizes it in a particular way. Uh, on the first line here, I have a Hamiltonian for a charged particle uh, in a given uh, external electric and magnetic fields, which are described by the potentials A and phi. We've seen this before. It was borrowed from classical mechanics. In particular, it does not include the spin. And as I just explained, it may be appropriate to ignore the spin, even if we know the particle has spin, and use a Hamiltonian like this. Now, if we do this, then a complete set of commuting observables is, uh, is made up by just the position of the particle. That's to say the x, y, and z components are three commuting operators. And uh, if we do this, then the position eigenkets uh, form a basis for the uh, Hilbert space for the system. Position eigenkets physically represent uh, the state of the system after a measurement has been made, finding the position of the particle in some small region around a point of three-dimensional space. And these position eigenkets are parameterized by the position, which is a point in a three-dimensional space. It's a continuous index. Uh, <clears throat> now, the orbital Hilbert space, which is a Hilbert space for this problem, is, a, is in a sense the span of these basis vectors. In making statements like this, I'm glossing over an awful lot of mathematics, but the basic idea is that, it's a, is that this is the basis, this constitutes, constitutes the basis for the orbital Hilbert space. Now, if phi is a state vector that lies inside this orbital Hilbert space, then its wave function is nothing but the scalar product of the position eigenkets of the state vector. In other words, the wave function is the expansion coefficients of the state vector with respect to the basis states, which in this case are the position eigenkets. Now, so that's, the, what, that's what happens if we ignore the spin degrees of freedom. In another class of problems, however, we, uh, we keep the spin degrees of freedom and ignore the spatial ones. We did this for the spins in the magnetic field when a Hamiltonian was taken to be the mag minus magnetic moment dotted in the magnetic field. We allow the magnetic field to depend on time, but not to depend on space, because we're ignoring spatial degrees of freedom. This would be appropriate if the magnetic field is uniform and does not depend on space, or if it's uniform over the spatial extent of the wave function of the particle, so that it doesn't matter, the x dependence of v doesn't matter. But in that case, it may be reasonable just to concentrate on the spin degrees of freedom as we did. And then you get this Hamiltonian. 
Well, now, what is a complete set of commuting observables in this case? It can be taken as S squared and S sub Z. In fact, this is just what we did in our, in our analysis of the Stern Gerlach apparatus in which we constructed, actually constructed the Hilbert space out of the physical measurements. It's really S sub Z in that case, or mu Z, that we concentrated on. The operator S squared is actually superfluous here. The S squared operator is capital S squared. And this, the reason it's superfluous is because it's a constant. Uh, it has the value of, of a lowercase s times s plus 1 times h bar squared. Here, the capital S squared is the operator, and the lowercase s is, is the number, which we call the spin of the particle, and it's just a characteristic of, this, of the particle. So this operator is really a multiple of the identity, and that's why you don't really need it. In any case, the basis states in this case are the eigenstates of S squared and SZ, which we denote by S and M. S is just fixed. M, however, runs from minus S to plus S. The uh, spin Hilbert space itself is the span of these basis vectors. If we have the state chi, which belongs to the spin Hilbert space, then what we may call the wave function, the spin wave function can be seen as call it chi sub M, and it's the scalar product of these basis states with the, with the, uh, with the uh, state vector. Uh, uh, in another, another parts of this course or other lectures, instead of writing chi sub m for the spin and wave function, I may write it as chi sub m, like this. And moreover, uh, we oftentimes think of chi sub m as being arranged in the column vector, so with chi sub s at the top, chi sub s minus 1 next, we go all the way down to chi sub minus s, like this. This is a column vector with 2s plus 1 components. And they're all complex numbers. And as I'm sure you know, such a column vector is called a spinner. In this case, it's a spinner of complex numbers. However, for the discussion for today, I'm, I'm not going to use this chi sub m notation because I want to emphasize the similarity between the chi of m and the phi of r in terms of a wave function. In both cases, the wave function is just the expansion coefficients of the state uh, of, the, of the state of the system with respect to the basis states. All right. Now, on the third row, in some cases, we may need to include uh, the interaction between the spatial and spin degrees of freedom. This was the case in the sharing gerlach apparatus because it's precisely this interaction between spatial and spin degrees of freedom which causes the beam of atoms to split into two beams which are labeled by their spin states. One goes up and one goes down depending on the spin state, the mu sub z, which is proportional to s sub z. And so, uh, and so an appropriate Hamiltonian for, for a problem like this is the one I've written here. In which we have both the interaction of the charge with the external electric magnetic field, but also that of the spin of the magnetic field. Now actually in the case of the silver atoms, the charge is Q is zero, because those are neutral atoms. And so the QA and the Q phi terms don't appear. We just get a simple kinetic energy P squared over 2A minus mu dot B for the interaction of the spin. But more generally for a charged particle, this would be uh, this would be the Hamiltonian. All right, <clears throat> now, uh, what is the complete set of commuting observables in this case? Well, it's the position of the particle in S and C. It's a combination of the two previous ones. Uh, the basis kets are the simultaneous eigenstates of these two, R, uh, these two observables. There's a, there's a position, uh, it's Rm, position and an and, and S of Z eigenvalue. This basis ket physically represents the state of the system after a measurement has placed the position of the particle in a small region around a point R and in which the Z component of the angular momentum has been measured and had a value of M. Such as you take one of the two beams coming out of the stern gerlach and you make a measurement of position. That would be the state that you get resulting in this. And the, the, again, the R parameter runs over all three-dimensional space and the M parameter goes from minus S to plus S. The Hilbert space in this case, which I'll call the total Hilbert space, is the span of these basis states. And if we have a state psi, which is a state vector representing the state of the system, which lies in this total Hilbert space, then its wave function is defined as the scalar product of that basis state, excuse me, of that state vector psi with the basis states Rm corresponding to the complete set of commuting observables. And so I want you to, to understand that this is the uh, this is the this last column shows you how wave functions are defined in these three different cases. All right, so the point of this is to understand the wave functions for spatial spin and combine spatial plus spin degrees of freedom. <coughs> now, um, now, uh, 
I have the vague feeling I'm omitting something that I meant to mention, but I'll go on anyway because I can't think what it was. Uh, so let's talk about wave functions for particles with spin. As I've just indicated, these are psi of r comma m like this. Now it may happen that a wave function like this uh, can be factored into a product of a, let's call it an orbital wave function phi r times a spin wave function chi of m. So it's possible it could have this form. But I want to emphasize that this is a special case and that a general wave function uh, for a particle spin cannot be factorized in this manner. Yes, a question. So, um, in, in, for example, in, in number three, uh, line number three in the table, uh, we don't have s squared because are we assuming it to be a, a pure, a, a not an elementary, I mean, an elementary particle with a single s? Yes, because it's a constant operator. It's really proportional to the identity. So if it were, if it were a composite particle, then we could not say, we need to include s squared then? Would that be like? Uh, that's a somewhat more complicated question. For a composite particle, uh, like, well, the hydrogen atom itself is a composite particle, you really need to take into account the degrees of freedom of both the proton and the electron. So then it becomes actually a product of two spaces of the type three. See, because each of them has a little bit of spin. Does that help? We'll come back to, uh, actually, I'll come back to that point later on, because as I said, the spin of a, what we call the spin of a composite particle is really the total angular momentum of that composite particle. All right. That's an actually important point. All right. Uh, OK, so to return to the point here is just that this is a special case of a wave function in a, com in a composite system in the total Hilbert space. Um, and a general wave function does not have this form. However, a general wave function, can, uh, although it cannot be represented as a single product of, of wave functions from these two different spaces, it can in general be represented as a linear combination of such, wave, of, of such products. It's easy to see this. Uh, let's suppose we establish a basis of spatial wave, func spatial wave functions. Let me call it psi A of R, where A is an index that labels the basis of both 1, 2, and so on like this. So let's say this is a basis uh, in our, uh, our orbital Hilbert space, like this. And likewise, let me define a basis of uh, <coughs> the of M of spin wave functions, where E goes 1, 2, and so on like this. And so that this is a basis in E spin. And then it is possible to take an arbitrary wave function of, in, in the, uh, in, of, uh, of, of both the space and spin and to write it as a linear combination of products of these basis wave functions. In other words, a sum of A and B of some coefficients, let me call them CAB, times uh, phi sub A of R times chi sub B of M, like this. Now, how do I know this? Well, really all you're doing is just using these two bases to expand the two different dependencies of the wave function on, on uh, position R and M. Uh, and in particular, the expansion coefficient C A P then would be given by an integral over space D cubed R and the sum of magnetic quantum numbers M of the basis phi A of R complex conjugate, the basis chi B of M complex conjugate times psi of R common M. This is just using, I'm assuming these bases here are orthonormal, and this is just using the orthonormality of these bases to carry out the expansion. So the point of this is, is that although a general state in the, in the uh, combined space is not, cannot be represented as a product, it can always be represented as linear combinations of such products. All right. Now, um, now uh, I'm not sure if I'm done with this table yet. So I'll try not to erase it, but I want to say some more things. So uh, I'll do it in this space down here. <coughs> Uh, so when we have a situation like this, uh, where uh, wave functions in the combined space uh, consists of linear combinations of products of the uh, constituent spaces, we write this in a certain way. We say the combined space, which in this case is what I'm calling E total here in this, in this table here. We say that E total is a tensor product of the other two spaces, the constituent spaces E orbital and E spin in this case, which is these two here. <coughs> and this uh, O uh, X symbol here is a symbol for a tensor product. 
Now, uh, this is an, an example of a tensor product of Hilbert spaces. And I won't define the tensor product in, in, a, in a rigorous or mathematical way, because if I did, I think you'd find it rather unpalatable. It's the kind of thing mathematicians love and everyone else hates. But the um, a basic idea is, is that uh, the wave functions inside the tensor product space are all possible linear combinations that can be made out of products of wave functions from the two constituent spaces, just like you see up here. Okay. Likewise, uh, let me go to the top of the board there, where I have a, a particular wave function in the total space, which is a product of wave functions from the constituent spaces. And allow me to write this now in ket language. It would look like this. It would be, we'd say that psi is equal to the state phi tensor product with the state chi, looking like this. This is a different use of the tensor product symbol because it applies to kets and not to spaces. But what it means simply is just multiplication of wave functions, as you see up there. In fact, I'll say usually in the physics literature, people leave out the tensor product symbol, and they just write this as phi <coughs> times chi, uh, as, if it's a, as if it's a product. It is a kind of a product. And in fact, it corresponds to the ordinary, <coughs> ordinary multiplication of wave functions, so it's easy notation to remember. Also, uh, and as I mentioned, as I emphasized above, this is really only a special case that you get a product like this. But in the general case where you have a sum of products, this would look like this. You could say, you could say that psi is the sum on the indices A and B of expansion coefficient C A B, and then we have phi sub A tends to product <coughs> chi sub B like this. And as I say, people would usually leave out the tensor product sign if they're writing a physics paper. But this is a cat language for the same statement that's made up of all above in terms of wave functions. So this is a definition, in effect, of the tensor product no notation for both spaces and also for, uh, for state vectors. All right. <clears throat> now, uh, now uh, let's see. Uh, let me what to do next. Um, yes. Uh, so, all right. So this is... Um, this is the uh, some mathematical notation for tensor products and how you can find spaces. What I'd like to do now is to uh, return to the specific problem of hydrogen and to address the issue of including the spin, or hydrogen-like atoms, of including the spin degrees of freedom. Um, so we know that this is, if we're talking electrons, here we know electrons have spin. And we know that the spin interacts with the magnetic field by a term which is minus mu dot v. There's an interaction Hamiltonian that looks like that. Uh, the, uh, however, if we, uh, oh, and I'll tell you what, I'll make this even more general. Uh, instead of making this hydrogen, let me erase the hydrogen spectrum because I don't want to talk exactly about hydrogen anymore. And allow me to take this potential energy and replace it by, let's call it, charge of the electron times phi of r, like this, because this includes now not only the hydrogen-like atoms, but it allows us also to talk in the same breath in the case of the alkali atoms. I'll remind you that the alkali atoms have a core, a rotationally invariant core of electrons, giving us some electron density as a function of radius. And then you've got a single valence electron out here that you're interested in that has some position vector r, and they have some velocity v like this. <coughs> and the Hamiltonian is describing the dynamics of this single outer valence electron in the combined field of the nucleus, which is, has got a charge of plus zd at the center, uh, and as well as that of the, of the inner core electrons providing this approximately rotationally invariant uh, potential. So in any case, we have a Hamiltonian that looks like this where phi is the electrostatic potential of the combined nucleus as well as the core electrons. The point is, is that it's a function only of the radius, so it's a central force problem. It's a modified kind of Coulomb problem. Let's talk about this problem, and let's include the spin degrees of freedom. Now, as I just started to say, the spin, of course, interacts with magnetic fields. However, the field that we see here, if we work in a, in a frame which is attached to the nucleus, We'll assume the nucleus is infinitely heavy, a good approximation, so that the inertial frame is attached to the nucleus. Then in that case, uh, in, this, in this inertial frame, or nucleus frame, the electric field is just given by 
minus the gradient of, of the electrostatic potential, and the magnetic field is zero. That's what we'll call, maybe we'll call this the lab frame. It really means the same thing as the nucleus frame. So, looks like there is no mu dot B term for the electron. It isn't quite right, however, because the electron is moving. And thus, the electron can be thought of as, a, as being at rest in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a frame, which is moving with respect to the laboratory frame. And if you're in a moving frame, then you don't see the electric and magnetic fields of the, of the uh, lab frame. Instead, you see fields that are Lorentz transformed by the, by the motion of the electron. And so this leads us to consider Lorentz transformations, giving us fields E prime and B prime, where the prime refers to the moving frame, and the moving frame is one that's moving with the velocity of the electron. So I guess you've been doing this in, uh, in physics 209. You can work out the formulas for looking up for the formulas for this for the Lorentz transformation. Don't actually care about E prime. B prime is what we're interested in. It turns out to be minus V over C across with the electric field as seen in the lab frame, like that. And so the electron in its own rest frame does see an electric field, excuse me, magnetic field, but it's B prime and not, and not B. Uh, and so we have a guess that we should have a perturbing Hamiltonian, call it H1, which should be equal to minus mu dot B prime. And is this correct? The answer is it's not quite correct because you need to multiply by a factor of a half. Like this, minus a half times this. The half comes about because of Thomas recession. Uh, and um, the uh, Thomas recession is a big tangent that I uh, can't go off into and explain in detail because it would take two or three lectures to do it. Uh, but very roughly, uh, it involves the fact that this frame of the electron is not only has not only has a velocity, but it also has an acceleration. It's an accelerated frame. And what you find in special relativity that accelerated frames give rise to a rotation. It's as if the frame, the rest frame of the electron is rotating as well as, as, well as moving. Uh, now, uh, we know that in a rotating frame there are Coriolis forces. Uh, and we've also seen in the case of uh, magnetic resonance experiments that in these rotating frames the effect of the Coriolis forces is to, is to reduce or may enhance or reduce depending on the direction from the angular velocity, the effects of the magnetic field. And that this is what happened in on going to our rotating frames. We reduced the effect of the background magnetic field in the magnetic resonance experiments. And what you'll find is, is that the rotation due to Thomas precession, in fact, cancels out one half of the effective magnetic field that's produced by the Lorentz transformation. I'm really glossing over an awful lot of details, but that's the, that's the net result of this, and that's where the factor of one half comes from. There was a period in the, in the history of atomic physics when experiment did not agree with theory because people didn't know about this one half. In fact, they knew by looking at the data that it was a factor of two. Uh, but then Thomas wrote his paper on, uh, on uh, ro rotations generated by Lorentz transformations and accelerated frames, and everything seemed, everything was cleared up. So that was the, uh, that's some of the history of this. In any case, for our purposes today, let's just say that this is the Hamiltonian that we're going to be interested in, given the interaction of the electron with, uh, the, uh, with the fields, electromagnetic fields of the nucleus. Electrostatic in the lab frame, but electromagnetic fields also in the moving frame. All right, now, to make space, let me erase the Thomas precession part of this. These two vectors, we know things about the magnetic moment vector mu is with a minus sign, it's the g factor of the electron times e over uh, 2mc uh, times the spin, the minus sign, because the charge of the electron is negative. The magnetic field V prime, I just explained what that is by Lorentz transformations, that's minus V over C crossed into the electric field. The electric field is seen in the lab frame. The electric field E is equal to minus the gradient of phi, but we're assuming phi is a central force potential. So you can write this this way, it is minus uh, r vector over r times the d phi dr, is differentiated with respect to the radius upon which the potential depends. And if you combine all this, this together, you see you've got one, two, three, four minus signs, which all together give you a plus sign. And if we put this together, this becomes a charge e over 
2 m c squared here is the at times times the g factor g of the electron there's the 2 there's the e over 2 m c there's a, another factor of c there gives us c squared then we multiply this times 1 over r d phi dr I'm taking care of all the scalars first then to look at the vectors we have the spin s and then that's dotted in B prime, and B prime goes like B cross E, and E goes, and e goes like uh, the, the, it's in the direction of the radius R. So this turns into B cross R, is the final stuff that's left for vectors. And if you'll allow me to multiply this by the mass M and divide by the mass M down here to get it squared, we can do that. And uh, the, uh, oh, I made a mistake. There's actually two factors of two here and here. So this is a four. Uh, however, let's approximate the g factor of the electron by two, which is a very good approximation, in which case that two goes out, that four goes out and becomes a two. But as far as the mv cross r, notice that this is the same thing as the momentum crossed into r. And the momentum crossed into R is the same thing as minus R crossed into the momentum. You know, you have to, use, you have to be careful on using uh, identities of ordinary vector calculus uh, in a, in a, in a uh, situation like this because these are not uh, vectors of numbers, these are vectors of operators. And in particular, P and position and momentum operators don't commute with each other. Uh, so, actually, in general, it's not true for operators that A cross B is equal to minus B cross A. In this case, it works out all right because if you look at it in detail and see where the commutators are, you find out they vanish. In any case, the result is that this is minus the oracle angle of NFL. But anyway, when the smoke clears, here's what you end up with is you find that H1 is equal to minus E over twice M squared C squared times 1 over R times D phi dr times null dotted into S, like this. So there's a constant factor. There's a, something that depends purely on the radius. And then there's the dot product of null dot S. And as I'm sure you know, this is called the spin orbit, spin orbit term in the Hamiltonian. So to improve our model, our electrostatic spinless model, to include some extra physics, we include the, the spin orbit term, H1 there, which I'll just copy, minus E over to m squared c squared 1 over r d phi dr uh, times l dot s. And so this is a, an improved model for hydrogen, hydrogen light or alkali atoms including spin orbit term. Um, the main purpose of my lecture today is not to go into the the spin orbit or fine structure effects. We'll do that later, a few lectures down the line. Rather, I want to emphasize what's involved in incorporating spin degrees of freedom into wave functions and the dynamics. Yes. So when we went from, uh, say, line number three uh, in that table, uh, or actually line number one in the table, uh, and, and then to the Hamiltonian in the lower board here, yeah. so that we are using the same symbol P, but in the lower part, we need kinetic momentum and the upper, in the table entry, we are talking about canonical momentum? Well, that was because up here we had an external magnetic field, which is there. And uh, here, uh, we don't have an external magnetic field. The magnetic field came from Lorentz transforming the, uh, the electric field of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, um, of the, of the Coulomb, of the Coulomb electric field of the, of the nucleus and if it, it's an alkali atom also the screening cloud. This is hand waving. Uh, this is just all we're doing here is in, in effect is making guesses about what the proper Hamiltonian should be to incorporate these effects. Uh, the top, really the correct way to do this is to use relativistic quantum mechanics and then you find all these things come out very nicely. We'll do that in the second semester. In the meantime, it doesn't hurt to practice with some things that are derived just in a hand way to be matter. But this does describe the physics of what's going on as to where this term comes from. All right. Now, if there were a background electric field, then you'd need to include that Q dot, Q, Q, Q over C dot, uh, times A. You'd need that, the, the, the external electric field. 
By the way, in, in deriving this, I assume that the electric, that in the lab frame, the electric field was minus gradient five, the magnetic field was zero. One might ask if this is really true. Is it really true the magnetic field is zero in the lab frame? Well, let's look at the physics of it. So here's your nucleus with charge plus Cp, and here's your, here's your electron cloud if you're talking about an alkali, and here's the valence electron, which is what we're really interested in. I'm, I'm recreating a picture I just erased like this. <coughs> Well, um, are there any magnetic fields? Magnetic fields are produced by moving charges. So the question is, are there any moving charges here? The answer is, well, yes, there are. There's all these electrons that are, that are swarming around in this core. But it turns out they don't produce a magnetic field from their orbital motion because they're in, a, in closed shells, as it turns out. That cancels it all out. And they don't produce, the, the electrons, of course, also have, have a magnetic dipole moment from their spins, core electrons. But those magnetic fields from the spins cancel out too because the spins are all paired in, in, in full shells. This is what makes alkali atoms particularly simple. So you don't get any magnetic field from that. Here's something else where you might get a magnetic field from is the nucleus is not really an inertial frame because it has a finite mass. So as the electrons orbit, the nucleus is moving around and it creates a moving charge and so that produces a magnetic field. Well, we're ignoring that because it turns out to be very small. The nucleus may also have a, a magnetic moment itself because it has spin. In fact, it usually does. So there's a, there's a magnetic field produced by that. That's a real magnetic field in the lab frame that I'm, that I'm ignoring here. That's actually important. It gives rise to hyperfine interactions that we'll talk about later on. But for simplicity, I'm neglecting that as well. So we're ending up with a, in effect, with a B equals zero in the lab frame. So that help, it, helps, it helps cover some of the bases of the, of the physical situation here. All right. All right. So uh, the exercise now is to examine this Hamiltonian to repeat to a certain extent what we've done earlier uh, when we didn't have the spin orbit term, uh, but with now the uh, extra the extra term. Let me remind you that when we had just the, the first term, the Hamiltonian might, might now call this H zero, which was just the electrostatic model. Let me remind you that, we, that one of the first things we did was to notice that this H zero commutes with what I'll call orbital rotations, which can be parameterized by a classical rotation. And the argument we gave for that was is that the H0 is made up out of dot products of vectors. P squared is P dot P, the momentum is squared. The radius R is the square root of R dot R. Those are, uh, those are position vectors. It's logical that under orbital rotations, position and momentum get rotated like vectors, and so dot products are invariant. That's, that's not going through any rigorous derivation of this commutation relation. Uh, in fact, we'll study this. We'll study how things, tra how things, how operators transform into rotations more carefully in a couple of lectures. But it's, but it's certainly plausible that since this is made out of dot products and dot products are invariant in the rotations, that this Hamiltonian should commute with all rotations. In any case, if it does commute with all rotations, let me remind you that the, these are orbital rotations. If I write them in axis angle form. They look like this. It's e to minus i over h bar times theta times n hat dotted into L, the orbital angular momentum. Uh, by making this an infinitesimal rotation operator, this implies that our Hamiltonian commutes with all three components of orbital angular momentum. Of course, you can check this directly by working out commutators, but it follows from the theory of rotations as well. Works the other way. If h commutes with all three components of L, it commutes with any function of those three components of L, in particular the rotation operators. So this goes both ways. Now, next, given that H commutes with all three components of L, the question is, uh, can we form a set of commuting operators? Well, the three components of L don't commute with each other, but L squared and LZ do. They commute with each other. And so, making that with H, what we get is a set of three commuting operators. And by looking for the eigenfunctions of these three commuting operators, we've got the usual uh, eigenfunctions RNL and R times Y elements of theta and phi for the solution of the Hamiltonian H0. That's our central force. That's a brief review of what we did in central force motion. Okay. Now, what happens when we include this term? Uh, again, let's talk about orbital rotations. Does the spin orbit term commute with orbital rotations? The answer is no. Uh, the angular momentum vector is a spatial vector. It's r cross p. So if you rotate, orbital rotations will cause, cause that vector to rotate. 
But if the spin vector is depends on the spin, which is not affected by orbital rotation, so you've got a dot product and you're rotating one of the vectors and not the other. Therefore, this dot product is not invariant. And therefore, because of this term, the Hamiltonian no longer commutes with orbital rotations. And so it doesn't, in particular, it doesn't commute with L squared and LZ anymore either. At least there's no reason that it, it doesn't compute with L, commute with L vector anymore. So uh, what do we do? Well, the first thing to notice is, is that there's actually two kinds of rotations that appear in this Hamiltonian. There's orbital and spin rotations. A spin rotation is one that's defined in terms of, and we've seen spin rotations when we were talking about purely spin systems. If you just use the spin angular momentum instead of the orbital angular momentum, like this. Now, does this Hamiltonian commute with spin rotations? Well, the answer again is no. Because spin rotations will rotate spin vectors, namely that one, but they won't do anything to orbital vectors. So now what you're doing is you're rotating the other, other half of the Scott product. And again, it won't be invariant under those rotations. Well, clearly, if you want to make this dot product invariant under rotations, you need to do both orbital and spin rotations at the same time, so that both sides of this dot product are rotated by the same rotation. And so this suggests that we look at what we'll call the total rotation operator, which if I write it in axis angle form, is nothing but a product of the orbital and the spin ones. The orbital with the same axis and angle, and the spin with the same axis and angle. Because if we do this, then the final term is invariant as well. So the Hamiltonian now commutes with total rotations, but not with either orbital or spin. As we see, there are rotation operators corresponding to different subclasses of degrees of freedom of the system, in this case orbital spin in total. And we can rotate one or the other without, without one without doing the other necessarily. Alright. Now this product of uh, spatial of this, these total rotations, if I write these in exponential form, the first one is e to the minus i over h bar times theta times n hat dotted into L. And the second one is e to the minus i over i over h bar times theta times n hat dotted into the spin s. So this product rotation has the general form of e to the x times e to the y. And these are operators now. <laughs> it's a kind of an ex product of exponentials we've seen before. Remember when we were talking about Glauber's theorem, we worked out some cases where x and y don't commute. Well, if x and y do commute, however, this actually, these, then, then the combination of exponentials obeys the same rules as ordinary numbers. And it just turns into e to the x plus y. This is true of x and y commute. Well, in the present case, the x and y do commute because the essentials here are the operators L and S. In particular, L commutes with S. Write it like this. Actually, L and S are vectors. What this really means is, is it means that every component of L commutes with every component of S. L by S J is equal to zero. The reason that these two operators commute L and S is because they act on different spaces. In fact, there's even a, a basic question of what do we even mean by an, an, an orbital angular momentum acting on a wave function for the combined system. What does that even mean? Well, it means this. If I have a, if I have a state psi and I decompose it into uh, products of of, of, of states from the two constituent spaces, like I explained a minute ago, if I had basis states like this. And suppose I have an operator, let me call it A, that acts, that acts only on, on, the, on the spatial on Hilbert space. But well, we can extend its definition to acting on, uh, on, the, uh, on the combined space by just saying that we get this co same coefficient, CAB, with A acting in the first term. Similarly, if you have an operator B that acts only in the spin part, you can write it this way as a sum of AB with the same coefficient CAB phi A, and then the B acts on the, on the spin part, like this. So for operators that are either purely orbital or purely spin, their definition is easily extended by using linear superposition into operators that act on the combined space. It's kind of obvious, actually. It's, it's an obvious thing to do. Um, but, it's, it, but it's also clear from these formulas that operators of these form, the purely orbital and the purely spin operator, commute with each other because it won't matter what order you apply them in. They act on different spaces. And that's the reason for this commutator being zero. And therefore, these exponentials can be combined. 
And so this thing turns into, this combined rotation operator turns into e to the minus i over h bar theta n hat. I really want to take the sum of these two exponents. Let me write this sum this way as n hat dotted into j, where j is now defined as L plus S. J is an operator which is the sum of the two angular momentum. And if we do this, then the total, the total rotations can be written as e to the minus i over h bar theta times n hat dotted into j. And so the total rotations are generated by the sums of the angular momenta of the mm -hmm. two constituent systems. All right. Okay. And in particular, the Hamiltonian, the full Hamiltonian now is going to commute with rotation operators of this form. So let me try to make some space for that. So here was, what, here was the argument involving H0. As I make the argument that the full H is not the orbital spin anymore, it's the total rotations. And this is going to imply that H commutes with the total angular momentum J. And in particular, that would mean that H will commute also with J squared and JZ. Now that doesn't mean that this is a complete set of commuting observables, but at least it's agreed they do commute. And uh, it raises the question of what are the eigenstates of J squared and JZ? What are the eigenstates of the whatever, whatever system you have, if you have an angular momentum that acts on it, the eigenstates of J squared and JZ are what we're calling the standard angular momentum basis for that, for that, for that system. And so this line of reasoning started from this Hamiltonian leads to the question is, what is the standard angular momentum basis for the combined system of orbital and spin? In effect, what are the eigenstates of J squared and JZ? Okay, so that's the question I'd like to turn to next. And I want to do it in a general context, not just this orbital and spin one, because we get a lot of uh, other uh, uh, cases. Uh, we don't want to be too specific at this point. So it doesn't be more general. So to be somewhat general about this, let's suppose we have two Hilbert spaces. Let's call them E1 and E2. And let's suppose there are angular momentum operators J1 and J2, which are defined on these, on these two spaces. And as a result of this, there are standard, standard angular momentum bases we can call gamma 1, J1, and M1 on the first space, and gamma 2, J2, and M2 on the second space. I'll remind you that the gamma is a general notation for any extra indices that are needed to, to resolve the genesis. Now, <clears throat> let's also then define the total space E, which is a tensor product of E1 cross E2. And in this case, we have an angular momentum J, total angular momentum, which is defined as J1 plus J2. And this will satisfy the standard angular momentum commutation relations. So we have an example of a space E with an angular momentum vector on it satisfying the standard angular momentum commutation relations. And therefore, it is possible to find a standard angular momentum basis, which I'll call gamma JM, on this space. And the question is, what is the relationship between the standard angular momentum basis on the product space in terms of the standard angular momentum basis on the two constituent spaces? spaces? Now, um, to analyze this question, uh, it, it suffices to deal with the case in which these two spaces consist of just a single irre irreducible subspace under rotations. An irreducible subspace, I'll remind you, is a space that's created when you apply raising and lowering operators to some, some stretch state. In particular, you would fix the gamma 1, m1, and just let the gamma 1, j1, and just let the m1 vary. If you did that, that gives you a single irreducible subspace. In the case of our, if you were to identify this with the orbital and spin example that we were looking at a minute ago, the spin example already is a single irreducible subspace. There's no need for gamma, and the j is the same as the spin s, which is just constant. Uh, however, the orbital space, in that case, would, would look like this, NLM, that's the notation we use for that. And to talk about a single irreducible subspace means we fix the N and the L and let the M be a variable. In other words, this is a, looking at the set of wave functions that look like this, R and L of R, times Y, L, and M of theta and phi, in which L and M are, are fixed, and, and we just let M vary from minus L to plus L. <coughs> So uh, in, in an L fixed. So this is a space that has dimension 2L plus 1. And of course, the spin space has dimension 2S plus 1. 
So because these are irreducible invariant, figured invariant subspaces, it suffices in taking in any, any spaces like E1 and A, E2 to break them up into their ir irreducible invariant subspaces and then just look at them one at a time. So for the orbital degrees of freedom, let's just look at one space where N and L is fixed, and the spin is already a single space. What this means is that we can get rid of the index gamma 1 and gamma 2 in this notation because we don't need that if we're talking about a single irreducible subspace. Moreover, the ind indices J1 and J2 are fixed. So let me erase my example here. And let's just say that, that J1 and J2 here are fixed. So here, this is a this is a space where M1 is variable. This means this is a space, this means that the dimension, if I make a table of dimensions here, here I didn't leave a space. If I Here's the space, here's an angular momentum, here's the standard angular momentum basis, and if I make the dimension, the dimension of this one is 2j1 plus 1, and the dimension of that is 2j2 plus 1. And so the dimension of the product space is going to be the product of the dimensions, and it's going to be 2j1 plus 1 times 2j2 plus 1. How do I know that? I know that because the basis in this space is made up of products of basis vectors in the constituent spaces. Right. Let's talk about basis in E. It is J1M1. To be explicit about it, I'll put in the tensor product sign J2M2. It's the product of the basis vectors in the constituent spaces. Usually I'll leave out the tensor product sign and just write this as J1M1 times J2M2 because that's what it is for wave functions. It's just multiplying the wave functions. And in fact, I'll write this in yet another form as J1, J2, M1, M2, like this. It means the same thing. But I'll call this the uncoupled basis. It's the uncoupled basis in our product space E. All right. Now, and also, we'd also like to find the standard angular momentum basis in this space. That's what we're really aiming for. Uh, and, uh, and, and this, as far as we know, at this point, this could involve an extra index gamma because the standard angular momentum basis is the eigenbasis of j squared and jz. That's the total j squared and jz. And without doing any further work, uh, we don't know whether we need an extra, an extra index to resolve possible degeneracies. Actually, as it turns out, this problem, this extra index gamma is not needed here. What that means is that each angular momentum value j occurs. The ones that do occur occur only once. So as it turns out, we won't need the index gamma here either. Well, this gives us a second basis. So this, well, let's call this base E's in the end. There's a first basis. The second basis is the basis of JM, which is the eigenbasis of total j squared and jz. And this is what we call the couple basis. And now if we want to work with the eigenstates of total j squared and jz, which as we've seen we need to do if we want to talk about spin orbit terms, we need to get a transformation from the uncoupled basis to the coupled basis. This is just a change of basis in this product space that involves, you probably know, flexible coefficients. We'll talk about that next time. Okay, so that's all.